Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Quilt Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Frances O'Rourke Dow, and with this episode, we're starting a new year and a new format. I'll be sharing quilt stories with you every month, some of them written by me and some of them by other writers, along with book reviews, occasional interviews, and other fun stuff. Many of you subscribe to this podcast because sometime over the last four and a half years, you discovered my audiobook, Friendship Album 1933, and gave it a listen, maybe even more than once. Others of you learned about the Quilt Fiction Podcast during the spring of 2020 when I recorded Eliza Calvert Hall's quilting classic, Aunt Jane of Kentucky. If you'd like to listen to these stories, or listen again, or if you want to listen to the work-in-progress friendship album, Forget Me Not, you still can. Just head on over to the Quilt Fiction website, quiltfiction.com, and click Join Now. A menu will drop down. Click on Membership Types to be taken to the page that tells you all about Story Guild memberships and subscriptions. To access the Friendship Album stories, Old and New, Aunt Jane, and my new work in progress, Diary of a Mad Quilter, you'll need to subscribe. There are two subscription levels, a $10 monthly subscription and an annual subscription that works out to $6 a month. If buying a subscription isn't in your budget right now, then please consider becoming a free member. In the Quilt Fiction Story Guild, even free membership has its privileges. We're posting the print version of Diary of a Mad Quilter on the member website, and we recently posted the print version of the latest friendship album story, The Namesake. Free members can read these stories online. They can also join the upcoming Loves Me, Loves Me Not Quilt Along, get discounts on books and patterns, and can expect some unexpected goodies from time to time. So check out the membership website and consider joining at any level. We'd love to have you. And speaking of the quilt along, it starts on January 30th, although information about fabric requirements and the like has already been posted. The quilt, designed by my dear friend Patty Dudek of Elm Street Quilts, is based on the new friendship album Work in Progress, Forget Me Not. You can find all about it on the Quilt Fiction website. Join us, won't you? Patty has signed up an all-star roster of sponsors, and the giveaways we have on offer are stellar. Not to mention that it's a beautiful quilt. Okay, let's get on with today's story. In just a moment, you'll hear me read a short story by my favorite writer-turned-quilter-turned-writer, Marianne Fonz. I stumbled across this story in the late great journal Quilt Digest years before I met Marianne. The Quilt Digest was a short-lived publication, five issues in all, put out by Roderick Karakoff and Michael Kyle in the 1980s. If you're a quilt history buff, as I am, you'll recognize the names of the contributors, Barbara Brackman, Julie Silber, Patsy Orlovsky, among others. I wasn't surprised to see these writers had contributed to Quilt Digest, but Marianne Fonz? Moreover, Marianne's contribution was a short story, and a charming, beautifully written short story at that. Fast forward to, oh, I don't know, 2018 maybe? One day, out of the blue, Marianne Fonz emailed me. After years of backburning her writing life, she was back at it. She'd come across my book, Birds in the Air, and was curious who my agent was. With that email, a correspondence, and eventually a friendship was born. So when I started thinking about what and whose stories I wanted to read on the Quilt Fiction podcast, Mary Ann came immediately to mind. I emailed her for permission to read her story from that long-ago issue of Quilt Digest, and she graciously gave it. Not only that, she agreed to be interviewed for today's episode. So that's what's coming up. Me reading Crazy Quilt, and then the interview that Marianne and I recorded last week. I'm excited for you to not only hear the story, but to also hear Marianne talking about her writing life. It's a different 
and super interesting side of one of our best known and most beloved quilters. Here we go. Crazy Quilt by Mary Ann Fons, read by Francis O'Rourke Dowell. My husband thought the situation was caused by poor ventilation. What I mean is, Harold deduced from the available facts that our odd experiences were the result of insufficient oxygen. That's how Harold is, practical, deductive. I can just see his mind at work. First, he said to himself, During the night, my wife and I both had extremely odd and uncanny dreams. Undoubtedly, some condition is affecting the atmosphere in the room where we are sleeping, lessening the amount of oxygen available to our brains. Thus, the dreams. Then he would conclude... A window must be opened. It was, you might say, an open and shut case. Just the thing for Harold, my future lawyer. His mind is like a computer. The facts are fed in, sorted, analyzed, and a rational, objective solution is produced. Now, I'm not like Harold. I get all wrapped up in one detail at a time, forgetting the others until their turns come. I was sitting up in bed, still groggy from my dream. Spread on our bed was the big patchwork quilt, and as I looked at all its colors and patterns and shapes, I knew the quilt itself caused the dreams. Sunday, the day before, we had gone to a flea market and made one purchase. I saw the quilt at a distance, hanging on a line. It was not a set pattern, symmetrical, but a crazy quilt, a wild conglomeration of irregular scraps. A whole world seemed to be alive on it. A Christmas present to ourselves, I thought. I convinced Harold of its quality, its warmth, and its value as a collector's item. We carried it home. The next morning, as I said, I was sitting up in bed, fingering a tiny scrap of brownish velvet. I took a deep breath and said, No, Harold, there's plenty of oxygen. It's the quilt. Oh, Martha, Harold replied. He was standing before the window, and the morning light put half his face in shadow, but I could read his exasperation. My dear, I love you, he said, but the ideas you have utterly astound me. My theory was simple. The fabrics actually absorbed the lives of those who had worn them. When we were covered by the quilt, the history of those personalities seeped into us. Harold wouldn't buy my view. Don't let me forget to open that window tonight, was all he said. I dropped Harold off at the university, where he's a law student, and drove on downtown to my job at the bookstore. I was supposed to be rearranging a stack of art books for the pre-Christmas sale. The manager wanted all the coffee table editions prominently displayed, but I had a hard time keeping my mind on my work. Last night's dream kept creeping to the surface. I had dreamed of a night deep in the winter, out in some open country place where the snow was three feet deep on the ground. The sky was clear and the moon was full. I was trying to run through the snow, but I kept falling and getting back up. My body was heavy and I was wearing a long, thick nightgown and was barefoot. Every time I fell, my hair would tangle around my face. As I got up, I would push it back. Even in the dream, it seemed strange not to be cold. A farmhouse was up ahead of me, and I was stumbling toward it. At the bookstore that day, I sat on my little three-legged stool amid the rows of books on Leonardo da Vinci and Van Gogh and tried to remember the rest of my dream. There had been more, but it was lost, slipped back to wherever dreams go. 
That night, Harold remembered to open the window a crack. We both sat up a while reading. Harold was engrossed in his civil procedures, and I was nearing the end of Don Quixote. I came to the part where Quixote and Sancho are stampeded by a huge herd of pigs, and I just collapsed with laughter. I made him put down his tome. I read him a few paragraphs and got him laughing, too. We laughed, and the bed shook. Harold was snoring softly before I dropped off to sleep, and the last thing I remember was stroking the top of the crazy quilt, finding a little patch of silk and wondering whose party dress it had belonged to. The next morning, the alarm rang. Harold thrust his arm out from under the covers and shut it off. He groaned and flopped back against the pillows. Nightmare, he said. Perfect nightmare. Shoveling snow. Incredible speed. A dozen men. A dozen men, Harold? I asked. Shoveling snow off the road so the horses could pull a wagon through? Yes, yes. He was confounded. Exactly, Martha, but how could you know? He was wide awake, staring at me nearsightedly in the pale light of the morning. I was wrapped in blankets in the back of the wagon. Everyone was saying I was mad. But that woman was old. She must have weighed 250 pounds. She was raving and carrying on. Martha, this is ridiculous. We can't dream the same dream. But we had. We had dreamed the same thing. As an old woman, I had seen the farmhouse through the trees and gone to the window. I knocked on the frost and a lamp was lighted. People peered at me from within and tried to make me come inside, called me Cordelia, then chased and caught me and wrapped me in blankets. They tied my bare feet in rags. I struggled as they put me in the wagon, but I felt calm inside and could hear everything they said. The horses pulled the wagon forward as the men shoveled the way clear. It took a third night under the quilt before Harold was convinced. The day had worn the edges off the weird, snowy night, and by evening, Harold was sure the window only needed a few inches more. I myself was profoundly interested in the night ahead. I wanted to know where the old woman was going in the wagon. But I didn't find out. Instead, I found myself in the arms of a man with a silken beard. I snuggled up to Harold, and he became a ruddy face, eyes crinkling at the corners, a scimitar of a smile in the moonlight, and warm lips that whispered, Sarah, oh, Sarah, how I love thee. Such a strange, ruddy young man, so real, his broad shoulders and unbuttoned woolly union suit. Morning came with the light filtering through the sheer curtains of our apartment window. I lay still with my arms wrapped around my husband and watched him sleeping. His nostrils moved a little with each breath and his lips were parted. I studied the details of his face, each curve of bone and flesh. Harold, I thought to myself, are you the man of my dreams? When he opened his eyes, he seemed not to know me. And then he did, and I knew it had happened again. Harold found it difficult to accept what had occurred. He kept thinking there had to be a logical explanation, but of course there just wasn't one. It's not possible, he said. It's unnatural. It's supernatural. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before, Martha. I must be going nuts. I was worried about him. For a person like me, an incident without a normal explanation presents no problem. In fact, I rather like the idea, the mysteries of life and all that. But for Harold, it meant a complete breakdown of world order. A raw element had invaded his otherwise well-disciplined mind and threatened him in a truly frightening way. His usually cool brown eyes looked strained behind his glasses. I knew he was tired. I called in sick at work, and Harold stayed home from the university. Classes were out for the holidays, and he was just studying anyway. 
He sat in the rocking chair, wrapped in a terry cloth bathrobe, and stared at the floor. His sandy hair was tousled and cowlicked in the back. He reminded me of a little boy home from school with a cold. Want some hot cocoa? I asked him. I poured the milk into a saucepan and turned on the flame. He kept watching the floor and then burst out laughing. Preposterous! He guffawed. Preposterous! I'm letting myself get worked up over nothing. I'm just going to forget about the whole thing. Do me a favor, love. Fold that thing up, wrap it in tissue, and put it in the very back of the closet. And let's forget all about it. Good idea, I said, humoring him. Forget all about it. Brilliant conclusion to a painful case. Harold moved to the table with his cocoa and began spreading out papers and books. He would spend the day at his work after all and wipe out all this foolishness. I smiled at Harold, being so himself. In the bedroom, I tossed the pillows on the floor and began to smooth out the sheets. I pulled the quilt off the bed and gathered up its four corners. As I was folding it, my eye caught an interesting scrap I hadn't noticed before. It was a lovely crescent, like a piece of night, embroidered with stars around its edges, a fancy stitch of white. All the pieces of the quilt were fancy stitched around the edges, as though each had its own little fence or frame. There were embroidered and painted flowers, animals, and birds everywhere, and I sank to the floor, studying scrap after scrap. The shapes were like people, I thought, like human hearts. As my fingers moved from patch to patch, memories slid by me of farmhouse rooms, attic cobwebs, beds of childbirth, hay wagon rides, mattresses on the floor, card table tents. I had to do some rearranging in the closet to find space for the folded quilt. I pulled out a sack of old clothes for the Salvation Army box. That evening, the light was switched off with a sigh from both of us. I guess it was a relief on Harold's part, and on mine too, but I had regrets. I was leaving dozens of dream persons inhospitably cramped in the closet. We both slept soundly, deeply, right through the alarm, and had to rush like mad to make it to campus and work on time. We didn't have a moment to talk about dreams. Besides, there was nothing to discuss. All I could remember was the ordinary succession of familiar faces and unfamiliar settings, the usual odd combinations of everyday elements, late arrivals at work and buses going backwards. I don't know if Harold dreamed at all. The bookstore was a madhouse that day, people buying armloads of books for Christmas presents, cookbooks, travel books, children's books, bestsellers, everyone wanting boxes and gift wrapping. It was almost six by the time we got the money counted and locked up the store. The car lights and freeway lights gave me a cozy, Christmassy feeling. I thought about getting a tree, but I knew Harold would say it was entirely too early. He insists that if you get one too soon, it's dry as a bone by Christmas, no matter what you do. He wasn't on his accustomed bench when I got to the university, so I assume he had caught a bus when I was late. The apartment was dark, but I could hear him snoring the moment I let myself in. I switched on a couple of lights and then looked in the bedroom. I couldn't believe what I saw. There was Harold, sprawled face down on the bed, wrapped in the crazy quilt. I shook his shoulder gently. Harold! Wake up, I said. Are you all right? He mumbled and groaned, and at first I couldn't make out what he was saying. Horse, beautiful horse, ran like the wind, won the race. Gradually, I got the whole story out of him. He hadn't been able to concentrate on his studies, couldn't work in the library, and at noon walked out to the street and caught a bus. I rode through the city, he said just feeling restless. The minute I got home, I went straight to the closet and unwrapped it. His eyes sparkled as he patted the quilt.
He had a marvelous dream about a racetrack and thoroughbred horses, a beautiful bay he had ridden first across the finish line. While I fried the hamburgers, Harold made a salad, or tried to. He was so excited about the horse race that he kept forgetting completely what he was doing. He recalled every detail of the course, the pastel colors of his silks and the ankle of the riding crop with its small tassel at the top. It was so thrilling, Martha, so real. I feel as though I were really there. We ate in silence, Harold lost in reverie, my own mind dazed and unbelieving. Only a day or so ago, Harold said he thought he was going nuts, and I hadn't taken him seriously. As I sat across from him at the table and watched the strange light in his eyes, I thought he might be right. When he got up yawning and said he thought he'd turn in early, I knew something was definitely wrong. When he stayed home from the university again the next day, I knew something had to be done. I thought bitterly of all Harold's plans for this vacation, how he was going to quote-unquote utilize the time to the utmost, as he put it, study next semester's material and catching up on all the little things that needed to be done, writing letters and doing bookkeeping. What a joke that turned out to be. Instead, he was spending all his time snoring under that plastic quilt. If it hadn't been Christmas vacation, Harold's future as a lawyer would be going down the drain. I bought a little Christmas tree on my way home that evening. He watched as I set it up. I had hoped the lights and decorations in my small collection of packages might snap him back into the real world. But he just stared at the little glass candles, the liquid bubbles reflected in his eyes, and said nothing. I began that night to cut little pieces out of the quilt with my fingernail scissors. I knelt by the bed while Harold slept softly, and with the utmost care, I snipped the embroidery thread, loosened each patch, removed it, and placed it in an envelope. It was midnight by the time I had removed just six pieces. I leaned my head down on the bed and tried to think. But soon I was sleeping and dreaming too, my face against the quilt. This time I saw rows and rows of growing vegetables. I was standing among them in a cotton dress, holding a hoe. Above me was an azure sky with friendly white clouds. A little toe-headed child held my hem and cried. The next morning I awoke stiff and disoriented. No alarm had been set, but I had time to change clothes and get to work. I drove down the street thinking about my still-sleeping husband, the patchwork quilt, and myself. Buying the quilt had been my idea. I was the one who knew right away that the quilt was responsible for the crazy dreams. I'm the one who is supposed to love mystery and magic. I've always said Harold was too studious, too conscientious, too dull, that he should open up a little and accept some strangeness in the world. I felt ashamed for what I had done to the quilt. It was an awful day all the way around. I was tired and preoccupied. I'm sure my customers figured I was a typically inept Christmas extra. As closing time came, I knew I would be up late again that night, putting the patches back. But when I got home, Harold was in the rocking chair, waiting for me, the inevitable crazy quilt draped across his knees. His robe was rumpled, His unopened books were on the table, and dirty dishes were everywhere. He had a sad, sleepy expression on his face, and he just looked at me while I put my purse down and got my coat off. Then he folded back a corner of the quilt to show the place I had scalped. How he must have studied that wild field of colors to have noticed my hand-sized crime— How could you, Martha? he asked. How could you do this? 
I got out my sewing box and the scraps I had cut off. I brought a lamp and a chair beside Harold and went to work, doing my best to re-sew the pieces just as they had been. Not really knowing how, I stitched around one and then another of the scraps, saying nothing. Harold watched me as I labored, and after an hour or so, I sensed a change in him, though he was silent too. It was as if he began thinking for himself again, as though he were no longer dreaming. I saw I was coming out short of cloth. I had folded back too much fabric, I guess. I had not been able to make the fancy embroidery stitches to join the pieces. Harold got up and brought over the sack set aside for the Salvation Army box. He pulled out an old shirt of his and a blouse of mine. Together we cut and trimmed two extra patches to complete the mending of the crazy quilt. Let's give it away, he said. Let's give it to someone for Christmas. My mind ran dully through the members of our families. I mean, he said, let's just go walking and find someone out in the world to give it to. I was slow putting on my coat while he practically jumped into his jeans and sweater. We gathered up the quilt and went outside. The air was cold as we walked down the sidewalk. Windows in all the old brick apartment houses were cheerily lighted up, squares and rectangles and occasional ovals of warmth, some with advent candles on the sills or holly wreaths hanging from the sashes, all shining out in a fabric of night. We came to the nearest busy street and turned by the corner grocery, Half of the little parking lot was filled with Christmas trees. The scent of evergreen reached us before we even saw them. There was an archway between the first two rows and a sign overhead that read, Odd Fellows Lodge No. 8. Through the archway, I could see the alley where a small trailer was parked for an office, and just to the side of it, a bonfire was crackling on the pavement, consuming the scraps of evergreen and fallen pine needles. A little old man was dozing in the doorway of the trailer, asleep with his head against the jam. His jacket was buttoned up to the neck, his short arms were folded on his chest, and his booted legs were crossed on the steps in front of him. He did not awaken as we tucked the quilt around him, his features seemed to change just slightly as the warmth of it enveloped him and a smile played at the corner of his mouth. I think he began to dream at once. Thanks so much, Marianne, for coming on the Quilt Fiction Podcast. It's so great to talk to you. Well, it's wonderful to have a reason for us to reconnect because we came, became pals years ago and then the pandemic happened. You know, we were at QuiltCon together. We met for the first time at QuiltCon in Louisville or Nashville. Was it Nashville? Yeah. Nashville. Okay. And we went to the bookstore, remember, in the rain? And oh, everything. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Because we went to Ann Hatchett's bookstore together. Do you remember where we Ubered? Did we try to get a it was a it was a long trip and it was yes. very fun, but yes. it was stormy and dramatic. And I think give it, getting the Uber back was hard, but that was wonderful. And I loved talking with you. We just walked along the shelves and said, have you read that? Have you read that? It was yep. really cool. Yep. And I think I didn't even have an Uber account then. I do now. And mm -hmm. uh, I went back because Ann Patchett did a reading or an interview with, um, I can't think of the, the name of the writer who's her good friend, McCracken. Um, oh, yeah. So I went back. Yes. And I went back. I took another long in the rain ride to uh, to be there at that bookstore. And uh, it was a wonderful experience to to because I'm a big fan of Ann Patchett's work. And I have read Elizabeth McCracken. Um, and so that was I can't, is it Parthenon Books? I think it's called. Yes. Yes. And it was great. It yeah. Was great. Oh, yeah. wow. And I think Elizabeth McCracken has a new book that is out. 
that got she did then too she that's yeah. why she was there and I can't remember the name of it Bowl, bowling for something or mm -hmm. and I bought it and I couldn't get into it but anyway yeah we could uh, we have to be careful because I think we could go down a lot of rabbit holes let's talk about Elizabeth McCracken's books and which ones we've read and which one yes <laughs> we're gonna be careful I want to um talk I want to start off our discussion uh, by talking about this story that uh, everyone has just heard, Crazy Quilt, which is a story I love, I find fascinating, and we're going to talk about the story itself. But I want to talk about you as a writer in 1985. That is when the story was published. I don't know when you wrote it, but this is an interesting time in Marianne uh, Fawns' history because you were Marianne Fawns. You and Liz were publishing books. Um, you were starting your empire, but you had not published uh, The Quilter's Complete Guide, which I think was huge. And you had not started Fawns and Porter's Love of Quilting, the magazine or the show. So who were you in 1985 and what were you doing writing this story? It's so great that you asked that because the story, there is a story behind this story and it's really a pretty good story. So I took a fiction writing class. I, I wrote the story quite a few years before it was published in the Quilt Digest. And you said it was in 1985 that it was in the Quilt Digest? Mm hmm Okay. So it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree uh, in English because I had a baby and I moved. And I then went right into graduate school in literature. There weren't MFAs back then. You just got a master's degree. But either at the end of my undergraduate work, or beginning of my graduate work, uh, I took a fiction writing course at Drake University from Hillary Masters, who was the son of Edgar Lee Masters, who wrote Spoon River Anthology. Oh, really? And, I, and I'd been writing about literature and writing uh, quilting, some quilting books, too. And I thought, fiction can't be that hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I took this fiction class and I thought I was going to flunk. But I was a new quilter at the time. And I had this idea that led to the story Crazy Quilt. And um, and I wrote it, and I wrote a couple other stories, but on the strength of Crazy Quilt, I like made a B in the class. So so mm. people like the story. And in short story, you know, I've been working on uh, novel length fiction, but short stories are a whole different ball game. So I wrote the story, I finished the class, and then um, I went to Houston Quilt Festival um, in... Three years before that book was that quilt, that story was published. And mm -hmm. Michael Kyle was an exhibitor there with Quilt Digest, the Quilt Digest. Mm -hmm. And even though Liz and I had published a couple of books and quilt books were starting to be a thing, this Quilt Digest press was so gorgeous. It was really kind of like what quilt folk is now. Um, it was pictorial, it was elegant. And I I reached out and shook hands with Michael Kyle, who became a friend. And I thought to myself, what can I do? to get myself in this publication it is so beautiful. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've got that story. So I dug out the typewritten copy of Crazy Quilt and I mailed it to Michael Kyle in San Francisco and they loved it. And Harold Nadel was the editor's name. And I remember I felt so proud because he said, Marianne, your star story needed practically no editing. Wow. And I think they paid me $300 to publish it, you know, and Michael had written with Penny McMorris a book on crazy quilts. And he went back to her for the, the quilt, a, a quilt to illustrate the story in the Quilt Digest. It was the Quilt Digest 3, the third of only five ever published. And, you know, there's a jockey in the story, you know, uh, that the that Harold, um, one of the patches on the quilt is of a jockey. And this crazy quilt that Penny came up with that had not appeared in their book had a jockey on it. And so that's my dog barking. So I mean, it was just amazing. And so, I mean, I was just so proud that that story was published. And I mean, because I love fiction and it just, it just, I just felt so privileged to be in that publication. And, you know, then time marched on. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that about quilt folk, because that's what I was thinking. It's how would I describe um, the, the quilt digest? Is it that quilters digest or quilt digest? No, the, the quilt digest and the publisher was the quilt digest press. And it was Michael Kyle and Rod Kirikoff 
uh, who mm. Rod Kirchhoff is very much involved in the quote world still. I mean, he's sort of mm. sort of newly relevant with um, uh, unexpected uh, and all the quilts he's collecting and um, such a force force in the quilt world. And he's in my age group, so it's pretty cool. But they were the owners of Quilt Digest Press. They published five uh, issues of the Quilt Digest. They're all wonderful. And then they published some other books too. Um, and then Michael was one of, was an early casualty of, in the AIDS crisis. We didn't mm -hmm. say that at the time, but looking back, we know that's what happened. So um, I still have correspondence with Michael and a picture of Michael. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a dear, dear person to wow. me. Well, um, oh, now I feel sad, but I, yeah. uh, but I'll, uh, but he, while he was here, he put out a beautiful publication and I don't think there's, you know, quilt folk is sim is, it has a different focus, but, um, it, it, it has this, I think the same preoccupation with, with making a beautiful magazine. Absolutely. And Mike, another Michael, Michael McCormick yeah. is a friend and, uh, in Quilt Folk, Iowa was the second uh, issue of Quilt Folk. And Mike and his team, this is early on, came to Winterset twice. And I met him. And when I saw what he was doing, I went to my shelf and I got out my five copies of the Quilt Digest. And I said, look at these. Look at, you know, he hadn't been aware of it, of course, because it was so long ago. And I said, what you're doing reminds me of this. So, you know, it's kind of a circle then that, uh, uh, Quill Folk was Michael McCormick's own idea. Mm -hmm. But when I met him, I saw the similarity, just as you're commenting, that it's it's stories and it's image rich. It's not how to. There's not advertising. It's a different animal. It's a keepsake. Mm -hmm. And I've kept my copies of Quilt Digest. And once in a while, I run across a copy of, of issue three that has my story in it. The first three were uh, what we call landscape. And mm -hmm. then the second, the last two were um, portrait in terms of their their format. Well, that's I I know I have uh, I have the copy that your story appeared in, and I got that years ago. And now I, it makes me think I don't have the last two because I can't picture the portrait. But it is it is lovely, and of course another full circle or another circling around is that your daughter Mary was the editor of Quilt yes. Folk for a period, and she is a wonderful writer in her own right. Um, and then I think oh, it's on, me, on it's on the board, but yes, but a wonderful yeah, yeah. writer like mother, like daughter. <laughs> And she is still very involved with Quilt Folk, more as a creative director than uh, editor-in-chief of the actual magazine. Mm -hmm. So she's involved with Quilt Folk, the company, more than the magazine now. Mm -hmm. And was responsible for getting a reissue of, unex what is it, Unexpected and Quilts? Unconventional. And, and which is my favorite quilt book. I mean, I haven't gotten my hand. I, I have the first one and I've actually thought about shelling out for the second one because I'd like to see the updates. But it's, it's an amazing book. Um, yeah, that's all very cool. And, you know, and I write for Quilt Folk now, um, and I, which is just uh, so fun for me uh, to, to be involved with that and to be telling stories in a different way. Um, like you, I write fiction and, um, and 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 I read fiction and I want to talk a little bit more about Crazy Quilt as a story because I found it fascinating. Um, you know, it's funny because when we were talking about doing this interview and me reading a uh, crazy quilt for the quilt fiction podcast. And you're like, well, you know, it is kind of a Christmas story. And part of me was like, tag, I don't want to wait till December to do this interview, um, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I was reading it and it's like, is it a Christmas story? You know, in some ways it is, it's take, it takes place during Christmas, but it's a, it's a, I feel like it's a story that on the surface, it's funny. There's a lot of humor. Um, the character, uh, characters are humorous, humorous, but I think there's, and excuse me if I'm overreading, I think there's a lot of darkness and weirdness in it too. It's not really a sentimental story, though. If I told someone, oh, there's this, you know, Marianne Bonds wrote a story about it, about people who have, they've gotten this crazy quilt and they, when they go to sleep under it, they have dreams. They might think, oh, what a fun romp. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it, it, parts of it are very funny and very fun, but there's darkness to it as well. Um, and I, you know, I, so the way that I, when I wrote up the questions for today's interview, I, in some ways it's an, an unsettling story. Um, the first dreams they have are, are kind of troubling. They, they get nicer 
Uh, I think they have some nice dreams as well. But Harold gets addicted to the quilt. What were you doing there? How, and and this, um, I'm always interested in how much control authors have over a story because sometimes, uh, you know, people read things into our stories that that. It's not that they're not there. We just didn't know they were there. But sometimes, you know, you can be very intentional. And I really felt like there is a tension that's that's in the story between the lighter, funnier part and to me, the more unsettling parts. So t talk to me about that. OK, so it's so interesting. No one's ever really analyzed this story before. And honest to Pete, when I wrote it, I was desperately trying to write a story that would get me a passing grade in that class. And I do think now that I've spent years studying fiction craft and writing fiction, that we unintentionally, we put foreshadowing in just because we're writers and, you know, it's just, it's there. And then, you know, we go back through a, a book link, a, fic, a novel length uh, manuscript, and we think we intensify that foreshadowing because we we realize now that we know the whole story, what's there. Um, but I, it, it was so interesting to look at your question about the darkness in this story, which I hadn't really thought about before, but it's true. I mean, you have this young married couple She's working at a bookstore. He's in law school, so she's supporting him. And this quilt that they bought kind of on a lark threatens to destroy their whole life, really, because if he can't go to school and finish his law degree, that's their going to be their method of support. And so, and I didn't reread the story, but I, I know that she gets very concerned and she winds up sabotaging the quilt, destroying mm -hmm. the quilt in order to get him back. Um, so uh, I, I don't... I, I don't, I just was trying to make a story, I think, mm -hmm. I, you know, a story that, that would, that people would like to read that my teacher would approve of. And I, I had not studied uh short story craft or, or fiction craft. I read a lot of literature because my degrees were in, uh, my undergrad was in uh, just straight English literature without a teaching certificate. I didn't want to be a school teacher. And although I love school teachers, and then my master's is just in literature. There were not MFAs back then. You just got a master's in literature. And so I loved literature. I had a lot of experience with stories. And that must have come to my aid. Um, but it's it's true. There There is the humor because I think there's a, a thing where the Christmas lights, the bubbles are kind of reflected in Harold's eyes, you know, and he he's just this nerdy a studious guy. And another kind of dark part about it is it's the way the story is told is he has no life. You know, he's never done anything interesting. And so when he starts having these unusual dreams, um, he, that it's just fun for him. Mm -hmm. But so, he, but it's so much fun that it's like, at some point, I <laughs> just imagine if she hadn't gotten rid of the quilt, if they had ultimately had not gotten rid of the quilt or uh, that, that he never would have left the apartment again. You know, right. there, there's right. something that, again, that the quilt seems to be feeding something in him. And yes, and perhaps it is that need for pleasure, that need for more than just, because the way he's described it almost surprised me um, not terribly, but it's like that he ended up being, that he was a, in law school. Cause he, he almost feels like, I mean, today I think he'd be a computer engineer, right? So maybe it's just, coder, exactly. Yeah, coder. exactly. I mean, he's that kind of guy. So I think that's probably, but, but lawyer struck me as, okay, yeah, I can see that too. Um, he, he, and, and, and then you have Martha in the bookstore, you know, with her sitting on, you know, with the Leonardo, the, the names, the Leonardo, the, the big art books, Leonardo da Vinci and what have you. And I feel like, She's got and, and she's intrigued by the mystery where at first he's trying to find a scientific explanation where she's like, live with the mystery, dude. And he's like, can't do that. I cannot. You know, I'm like, why are these two together? <laughs> good, that's that's a good question. Part? <laughs> I have to tell you, though, back in when I wrote this story, there were not computer coders. If there were no, <laughs> we didn't know about it at the time. Right. Um, but, yeah, she's the free spirit. She does. She, and. And, and and then of course then she has to come around at the end and be the realist the practical person in the end so so I'm like it amazes me that I could write such a kind of a brilliant story when I didn't even know how to do it but but it reminded <laughs> me that you know Liz and I wrote the first book we wrote was classic quilted vest in 1982 and it has general instructions and the the method of minding mitering corners Liz invented that Liz Porter invented that and it's now standard but she worked it out and it's in that book and you know we wrote that book um I was 32 at the time and and you, you know you think your writing keeps getting better and it does it's true mm -hmm. you, you think that it should 
But I mean, I go back and look at those instructions and darn, they were good. And I, I still have a file of some of my uh, uh, literary ed- essays, you know, uh, from graduate school. And I look at them and there's there's some vocabulary words I don't even use anymore because they pertain to crit- criticism. But it's like I was a good writer, always a good writer. And so um, if you get what I mean, you know, you do get better in your craft and you become more skilled. But um, I just always was a reader and a writer. And so in step by step and how to and even when Liz and I looked back and she transferred our earliest TV episodes to uh, discs, which are now kind of obsolete. It's like we were so new and green our very first episodes, but they were very good. Mm. The instruction was very good. So, um, but so it's just interesting to me that I was able to write a su- successful story, successful enough that I got through the class and also successful enough that Michael Kyle liked it and they would want to publish it and that you would want to read it yeah. right now. <laughs> well, and I think it is a successful story. Um, and I think, by the way, I think it's beautifully written. I, there, there are moments, uh, you know, and this is where Christmas comes in, where you know, but the Christmas lights and <laughs> in his eyes, but also... At one point, she's out walking at night, and it may be where she's uh, uh, where Harold went home early. But or it's or maybe it's when they're taking the quilt to give away. But they're beautiful. There's a beautiful description of the lights and the wind, the different kind of windows and the lights um, and, and all that. And and that's something I think I always admire extravagantly in other writers because I'm not very good at it. I, just, I have my strengths, but writing uh, somebody walking down the street. Um, you know, and, and and really giving that description. So I feel that the, the reader feels they're in the scene. I just felt like you did that beautifully. And um, yeah, and, and so the sentence level writing is very fine. And um, yeah, but I th- feel like, you know, when I, I teach writing um, and do a lot of writing workshops with, with young writers, and I always say, you know, if you want to be a writer, you need to be a reader. And that, and I, I feel like, there are no writing prodigies. There's no 10-year-old Shakespeare, but there are kids who have read so much and been read to so much that they are able, they write at a really high level at a very early age because there's there's some osmosis going on there. Now they have no idea about, <laughs> or, or the, the, as far as characterization, that's where they're the weakest because they don't have life experience. But just, but uh, in terms of plot and sentence level writing, it, whatever kid shows up in a workshop just writing at a high level, I'm like, do you read all the time? And they're like, yeah, I read all the time. And so by the time you wrote this story, just think of every uh, all you had studied and uh, and all the books you have read, and and that comes out. You know, if you, I just I feel like we do, we absorb form, we absorb language, and all these things. So I'm not surprised. Uh, well, it's heartening to know that these young students you have are such good writers because you know. These would be internet natives. And of course, people read a lot of things. They're reading things on their phone, can be reading books and so forth. Right. But it's neat to, you know, I, I think back raising my kids, they were born in 75, 79, and 82. And it's, they they were all readers. And, and we didn't have, we had three TV stations, you know, so they had their noses in books all the time. And they're still avid readers. So that, that's great. So, um, so, yeah, I think we do, um, on the sentence level, we do know what a sentence is. And my mother was a high school English teacher. So I had the grammar and everything down. I just like, how would my mom say it? And then I knew <laughs> what, but you know, something else you mentioned, you're getting back to the darkness and crazy <laughs> is about them giving the quilt to the man at the Christmas tree lot. And, you know, I just needed a way to end the story. And until you mentioned it, you know, I thought it was kind of cute how they gave this quilt to this old man. And, and, you know, I'm 73 now, so he was probably about my age or younger, <laughs> this, this character that I made. And I thought, well, he must have nothing going on in his life. He'll like this quilt with these dreams, you know, because he's just this old man. You know, So, <laughs> so I never thought that it didn't occur to me that like they're, they were dooming him to, uh, to nightmares or something like that. Cause they, they, they're putting it around him and he's warm, you know, and everything and he's smiling. So he's having a nice dream because, you know, some of that age wouldn't nothing, they, nothing nice would be happening to someone <laughs> that age. <laughs> so, so uh, it's kind of fun to look back on that aspect of it. Right. Because at that, so yeah, if he was in his seven, now we know 73 is practically a spring <laughs> chicken. Um, but, he, I, but I'll tell you what, one of the reasons why I, I 
came to that conclusion that that was a sort of ethically questionable thing for them to do is they considered like, should they give it to like a family member and decided against that? And I thought, ah, because they don't want to pass, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, not, I shouldn't say the curse, the curse of the crazy <laughs> world, because it's not that there's pleasure in it as well, but it's, it, I, I think there's some danger in it. So they are like, well, not, and then I thought, well, who on, you know, I, then I thought maybe they're going to go bury <laughs> So that, did they talk about giving it to someone else? I forgot that part. There's some brief mention. Like, should mm-hmm. we get, I don't know if it's discussed or that's just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, but that does come up. And so that's how I read it. So maybe mm-hmm. that, maybe this is just a, you know, 21st century <laughs> doom and gloom reading or, or what have you. But I, but I actually, I, and I don't disapprove of that choice, even if it wasn't made intentionally, because I think it makes it really interesting. Yeah. You know, what happens Obviously, next? These guys are Bonnie and Clyde. And now we, <laughs> and that's my question. What happened? What do you think might have happened to this couple? You know, after the story end, do they, they live happily ever after, or do they rob banks and, you know, go on a, a murder spree? Oh, or what do they do? That's a great question. Um, Harold and what's her name? Um, Martha. Martha. Um, well, I think, in the short term, you know, he, the holidays, the, 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 the winter break would be over and hopefully he would go back to school. But that's a really good question. Maybe I need to make this into a novel someday mm-hmm. is to how he's experienced this, this adventure, these adventures. And now he doesn't have a means. Well, a, a, a positive spin would be that having experienced these adventures, he decides that in addition to going to law school, he's going to, you know, take up fencing or something, or he's going to, you know, going to do something fun. Um, and maybe she, um, maybe Martha, who's working in the bookstore, and we don't know what her education level is, but she's well read, you know, so she's been in school probably too. They probably met in undergrad school. So, so maybe she thinks, well, hey, I better go to law school too, too because I can't really, I can't really count on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was married at the time I wrote this and then divorced that person. So, um, and had to make my own way, uh, as a career. So, um, there's all kinds of ways that think Martha and, and, uh, Harold's life could go. I mean, that's what a novel and that's what fiction is, is w- what can we do at, you know, paragraph three, what, what are they going to do in paragraph four? What can happen? And, in, and when I'm writing the novels that I'm I have in the works, and especially with my life with Shelley, I when I would come to a point where I needed to make up what happened in my current, modern day protagonist, I would go for a walk. And and my my teacher Rebecca Mackay does the same thing. Is I would go for a walk. I do a two mile uh, loop here in Winterset, and I keep walking. Think, what could they? How could happen? What could they do? What could they say? What could happen next? And usually by about mile one, an idea has dropped into my brain from the sky above. And if it's an idea that I think is good and it's and I start forming a sentence in my mind, I will just see, keep saying that sentence over and over and over in my brain as I walk because I write in the mornings. And if I say it in my brain enough times, the next morning when I'm writing, I remember it. And mm-hmm. I always remember Hemingway. I did an a individual study on Hemingway in grad school. Because all, all the writers were men then, you know, mm-hmm. and that that Hemingway would quit writing for the day when he knew what he was going to write next, not when he was out of ideas. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good tip for writers: is don't write till you run till it dribbles out, the faucet dr- dr- turns off. Right. Stop when you have a good idea, and that excites you to start the next day. That is so funny, Marianne, because I just passed that along to someone. Yesterday, that is one of my favorite pieces of writing advice. I th- I always um, know I, I stop at a good place or don't stop until I know what comes next. But I save that for the save next that. day because that's how you get started. You're like, and, and it makes you eager to get back to the the story because, like, I know what I'm doing next, and yeah. um, and and it and then that propels you to the next thing and the next thing. But I've always thought that was especially for, for writing a novel, um, some of the exactly. best. And exactly. And, you know, since we're talking about best writing advice, I'll share mine with you. I like that one too, but I read a, a, a writing book by this, um, I think his name was Warren Bishop, is a, 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 who was a noir writer. That is, here's a fascinating story. It's called um, How to Be a Great, great Writer. And you can buy it on a 
uh, a, by a nickel, you know, at, at Amazon, how to become a great writer, I think it is. He says, and this is for more for novels, I think. Until you write the whole story, you don't know the whole story. And only when you know the entire story can you become the administrator of the work. Oh, I love that. The administrator of the work is perfect. Yeah. So you have the first full draft. Once you have the complete draft and you go back and revise, which is the best part, you know everything then. You know the ending, you know everything, and you become it becomes a more administrative than a creative work. Well, and I'm someone I love revising. I hate writing first drafts. I'm terrible at it. They're awful. Um, which is fine. That's part of my process. I have to write the terrible first draft. The same with designing quilts. And I design most of my quilts on the wall. And it, I'm just, I come up with the worst ideas. But then when I have something on the wall or something on the screen or the page, then I can go, then I become the administrator. I revise and revision is beautiful because you've exactly. got, you've got the, and I'm trying to think who put it this way. I don't think it were, I no, it wasn't Rebecca Mackay. I'm a huge fan of hers and we might chat about her in a minute because you've worked with her for a while. Uh, but this idea that, oh, it was Shannon Hale who writes middle grade and young adult fiction and some adult fiction, where it's like the first draft is like bringing the sand to the sand box. And the second draft is where you actually make the castle. Yes. I'm like, yes. That's a great metaphor. Well, and you know, I'm kind of at a, I'm kind of at, have taken a pause on the book I'm writing right now. And of course, everybody's not, you and I are in Zoom, but it's like, here's my manuscript. See this? I have this story, you know, uh -huh. it's real uh, folks. She's showing real. me a real and, manuscript. And I, I realized I need to go deeper and really the motivations of my male characters are more challenging for me. And I'm about to start revising again, but I've taken a break, which mm. is scary because I'm always worried. I'll never get back to it, but I am. I, I invested too much. I mean, I got, I got 300 pages or 275 pages here. I've invested and there's such great stuff in it. And, uh, it will be finished. Now, is this winter set or my yes, my life? Winter okay. Set. And well, let's 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 go on to this. And we've already kind of moved on to this. Uh, you know, we've talked about the fact you've always been a writer. You have a background in literature. You've been writing for a long time. Um, I, I do. You, and anyone who gets your email, um, and I'll, I'll put some stuff in the show notes if anyone wants to sign up to your email newsletter knows that you are actively writing, but there are a lot of people, obviously, I think most quilters, when you hear the name Marianne Fonds, you think quilts, you think quilting, and they might be surprised to know um, what, uh, you know, the, what role writing has in your life now, which is central. It's central. Yeah. So talk about that. Talk, uh, talk uh, whatever way you want about the novels you have in progress, about uh, I mean, you're doing a lot of different, really fun, interesting things, doing good work. Talk about that. Your life as a writer. Well, my life as a writer, you know, I, I dreamed of writing fiction and I had to make a living. And so I wrote, you know, step by step and still pursued reading fiction and um, many quilt instructors that I hobnobbed with uh, teaching at conferences and uh, events around the country. We always compared notes about what we were reading. And I talked about writing. I was I've been fascinated by the life of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein for ever since I wrote about her in graduate school. And so after talking about it for years, I did buckle down to write this novel, My Life with Shelley. And I spent five years writing it. It's it's got a modern day protagonist who's a high school English teacher who's obsessed with Frankenstein and Mary Shelley. And when the story opens, she's had a biking accident. She's got a broken leg. And she decides to finally do what she's been threatening to do for years, which is write Mary Shelley's imagined memoir, which I did. I wrote the memoir and I wrote the exterior story. And I spent five years on it and then went to, to classes in Iowa City at the Summer Writing Festival, to classes through Story Studio Chicago, and uh, and and got an agent for my for my life with Shelley, who loved it. And she was sure we'd get a two book deal. And she took it into the marketplace and, and it did not find a publisher for it, which is pretty hard to take. And so it's on the shelf. And uh, she encouraged me to write the, the other idea that I had that was going to be the second deal on our two book deal, which is a novel that reimagines the Scarlet Letter, uh, in which is another favorite novel of mine in um, Winterset, Iowa, where I live in the late 50s and early 60s. So I've been working on that for several years. It's called Winterset. And we have a protagonist, Hester, who is a dressmaker, a very talented dressmaker. There's a minister, Arthur, 
they had the same first names as in the Scarlet Letter, but different last names. Arthur is a Methodist minister, and anyone who remembers the 50s knows the Methodists. That was, that was, they were the church, the Methodists. And then there's a pharmacist, the shady pharmacist that is the Roger character, and their baby is named Pearl. And so um, I've I've got the bulk of the story written, but and I know what the ending is, but I was having a real hard time writing the ending last year. And I sort of realized that I really needed to go back and um, deepen the conflict with the male characters and the relationship with, between the two male characters. So anyone who knows the Scarlet Letter knows that Roger Chillingworth and Arthur Dimsdale have a rather weird relationship. They actually live together. Mm. And uh, Roger kind of torments uh, torments Arthur. But one of the big differences in my story and in the Scarlet Letter is if you know the Scarlet Letter, if you read it in school, you might remember that at the end, you know, Arthur and Hester get together in the forest and they make plans to run away together, to go back to England and be a family. And then that, that plan is thwarted. But in my book, when Hester and Arthur see each other again, and by now Pearl is seven years old, and Arthur says, you know, I want to make an honest woman out of you. She's like, too late, buddy. <laughs> it's been seven years. And by now she has a dressmaking business. She's making beautiful dresses for the elite women of Des Moines who don't care that she's a fallen woman. She's employing other women. She's bought her home. She's learned to drive. She has a car. She's raised Pearl. And so um, she uh, is not interested in this man that she had, you know, a night of passion. Another thing about the Scarlet Letter is we have no idea how this Puritan minister and this woman ever got together to conceive a child. Hawthorne does not tell us anything about it. We don't know how could they possibly have had the privacy. But in my book, I didn't set out to write sex scenes, but I do have sex scenes because we know how it happens. We were there when it happens. And, and my dream, if I can make this book good enough and get have it published, get a publisher, is that it'll do for Madison County all over again with the bridges of Madison County did, which sold 60 million copies um, because I have everything in Madison County is the is city park. I have all the businesses that were around the square in the late fifties. They're all in my book. Um, there are a couple of secondary characters who were actual people that lived in Winterset that are gone now that I know that are key figures in the story. So um, anyway, uh, you know, you know what it's like, Francis, when you're writing, uh, you live in that story. You know, it's like you're living in your life, but you're also living within the story. And it is so thrilling. It's well, you, you're, you've created this world that you inhabit yes. every day and kind of inhabits you. Um, and it is thrilling. It can be a little crazy making. It's like you, you're constantly having to wake up from not constantly, but at, you know, at some point in your day, you have to walk out of that dream you've created into doing the dishes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But when I am writing, when I'm, when I'm happily writing and I'm about to do it again, I mean, when I put my head on my pillow at night, I go into that story and I think about where it is. And when I wake up in the morning, I put my head in that story. Mm -hmm. and it just makes me happy. E even when the writing's not going well, but I can always revise, you know, if I can't push the story forward, I can always revise something. And, you know, one of the things that people often don't understand is how important an editor is to the process of writing and revising a book, particularly revising. You do the first draft and then you have someone read it. And I've always felt my editor uh, really should have her name under mine, uh, my uh, my children's fiction. It's such a collaborative process. And that's another reason why I love revising. I don't think people understand how collaborative the process can be. And although I've frequently asked my editor, why don't, you know, she'll say, oh, I think you need a scene with such and such going on. I'm like, you could write it. And she never will. She and the 25 years we've worked together, she's never jumped on that. But nonetheless, there's a lot of back and forth and we'll work at plot points. Now you have, let's get back to, to Rebecca Mackay. I know you've taken classes with her. Um, has she worked in any way in that capacity? And for people who don't know, Rebecca Mackay is a very fine writer. Her last book was The Great Believers, one of my favorite books of the last decade. I think it's masterful. She has a new book coming out in February, which I will go and buy in hardback as soon as it comes out. I can't Same. wait. Um, and, and Marianne has been working with Rebecca, I think took a year long 
workshop and perhaps has worked in other ways, but she is a remarkable talent. And she also, she has a newsletter now, a Substack, in which she gives writing oh, advice. I didn't I know that. To. But talk about um, how editors have worked in your life. And particularly, I think Rebecca has worked as a kind of editor for you. Well, Re Rebecca is the creative director at Story Studio Chicago. So if anybody's listening to this that is interested in writing classes, go to Story Studio Chicago. It's one of many places, but there's lots of on online classes and they're very good. Um, I took a year-long class from her when I first started Winterset called Novel in a Year, where I went to Chicago once a month to meet in person with my cohort. And then the pandemic happened and we met online. But we've gotten together, our cohort has gotten together for parties a couple of times. But um, Rebecca hasn't really worked at editing my work. I did hire her to read My Life with Shelley and give me input on that for when the time comes that I revise that novel. Um, but what I've done, and this might help anybody who's listening who's interested in writing, is I have... I have a writer's group in Des Moines, the West Des Moines Library writers, and we're all fiction writers. And, um, you know, I don't know if any of us will ever be published, but, you know, we meet twice a month for three hours on a Saturday in the middle of the day, unlike a lot of writing groups or meet at night once a month. And so we critique each other's work. And so each er, twice a month, you know, I take 1500 words that I read and I get their input and I get great input. And it's it's the input is part of it, but it also it's the accountability that like, oh, I need to have 1500 words ready to go. And we meet Saturday. We had to skip December. And so I after taking a long pause on winter set and I'm starting from the beginning again is I pulled up uh, uh, the beginning and I'm tweaking, you know, the, the that for Saturday. So that's that's going to carry me through this revision is the the accountability. And if we can't meet in person, someone zooms zooms us in if we're not if we're out of town now. So the writing group is very important. And then the other thing I'm sure you know all about is and you talked about your editor because you are a working writer and you have an editor and a publisher, but there's also um, uh, your beta readers. So, you know, when I finish Winterset, I have uh, probably, gosh, I mean, I could stop at six, but I have a lot of volunteers, local people, you know, that born and raised in Winterset, mm -hmm. uh, fashion people, um, a pharmacy person, because I have a pharmacist in there. And, and I will ask them to read this now and, and just readers. People that just love to that buy books, you know, right. and I know with uh, my life with Shelley, I used input from everybody. So, mm -hmm. you know, you send it out for these beta readers to just read it and to give you notes. And, and, you know, it's like, it, I, I mean, I love input because it's like, if, if, if my friend uh, Sherry doesn't understand this part of this novel, many other people might not understand right. that either. So I need to clarify that. Right. And, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure you run into writers that just won't take notes and won't take advice and just and so when someone new joins our writing group and we give comments and they argue back, <laughs> I'm like, well, they'll get they'll get to the, you know, pretty soon they, if they're going to stick around, they're going to realize that the input is invaluable. And I think people who've not experienced this kind of input uh, want to defend the way it is. And I just know that, that my fellow writers have, you know, said, I mean, in fact, Oscar, not long ago said, you know, I think you should start here, start with this so that the conflict in my character's marriage is obvious from the very first paragraph. So, mm -hmm. and so I did, I, and it's, you know, when you think someone says, take the paragraph on page three and put that at the beginning, you think that'd be real easy. No, you have to redo everything to make that work. Right. Right. Well, I, you know, I, um, I published my children's fiction with Simon and Schuster. So I have a big time professional editor, but you know, the, the quilt fiction fiction that uh, I published through uh, my own publishing company that I run with Clifton, my husband, Milton Falls Media, I depend on friends to read drafts. Mm -hmm. And these are, um, you know, my friends are readers. They don't, you know, they're not former English majors or what have you. Exactly. What I, ask them to do is just read and then report their experience of reading. Where did they have questions? Where were they confused? Where did they feel a character was behaving out of character? Any kind of feedback like that is really useful. And you don't have to have someone who is professional, top of their game editor, just a, someone who is a good reader. Um, and they're, they're almost better. Yeah, I think so. And especially because they don't have any 
skin in the game. Not that I feel like my editor, Caitlin, has, you know, she wants, she's very much, she's very art, she's very uh, literary. So she's really trying to help me write the best book. Um, but, you know, she's also thinking about how a reviewer is going to see this. How are the sales and marketing people going to respond to this? Whereas my friend Kristen, who reads everything, so that's, she's like, you know, she's like, is it a good story? Or mm -hmm. just, I'm just like, ask questions, ask questions. And she's, I think, one of the best editors that I've had. And so is my husband, Clifton, who actually worked as an editor at Algon Algonquin Books years and years ago. We had to get through that. Stop main, stop saying mean things to me. You're my husband. And, and he wasn't <laughs> saying mean things. But but um, yeah. So anyway, I think anyone, can, we have editors all around us, which is very cool and and very good to know. It's like, you don't have to, you, right. you just call some friends who read books and say, would you right. read this and give me your honest feedback and start out by saying something nice? <laughs> well, and sometimes, I mean, some of my readers are my writing friends because, you know, they're, but they're great readers that have no pretension of ever wanting to write anything themselves. But I think uh, on your team of, of beta readers, I think having one of your writing friends who's looking for craft uh, mm -hmm. is yes. Yeah. Important. yeah, I think so, too. Well, let's um, I want to uh, kind of make a, a, a leap, which I don't think is actually a huge leap from writing fiction to making quilts. Um, and I'm curious. So first of all, if you see any parallels in that process, you have been making quilts for a long time now, um, which is also a, a creative endeavor, obviously, and designing quilts. What what parallels do you see in these creative activities? The one that does, one that involves words, one not so much. Yeah, I see tons of parallels. I think about it all the time. And and my plan had been, if uh, My Life with Shelley had found a publisher, I was going to do a, a, a lecture called Read My Latest Quilt, where I would uh, present images of quilts with words on them, which I love, and then talk about the similarities. But, you know, it's like thinking about right now, um, I, I know how to write a scene, but is it the right scene for the book? So I know how to make a block. I know how to make a quilt, but is it the right fabric? Is it the right block? Does it work together as a mm -hmm. whole? And you can certainly think about, you know, ripping out things as re revising, although I don't rip out a lot because I'm a pretty good sewer. But, you know, you're revising and editing your quilt as, as you, you know, and so you can think of the blocks almost as chapters or scenes mm -hmm. that, that that all needs to work together co cohesively. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are definitely parallels and, uh, you know, it's a creative process. So I think that it makes sense that people who like to sew and stitch things together in terms of fabric would be stitching words together, even mm -hmm. though they are so different in terms of visual and, you know, in your brain and in front of your eye. But um, I guess I would say that writing quilting books and making quilts certainly is part of what prepared me to write fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that, I think that, I mean, my daughter, Mary, has always been good at asking hard questions. And she's asked me so often, you know, why are you doing this, mom? What's your purpose? Why are you writing? And, you know, part of me, I, I have many reasons. And I think I think everybody does things for several reasons. You don't do it for, for just a single reason. But, you know, I want to prove that I can do it. But ultimately, I want to give people a great read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think the greatest compliment, a friend of mine was reading a novel. It was by Amy Tan. And she said, I, I just, I hated to see it end, mm. you know, and, and I think that's the greatest compliment. And I sure, I'm sure anyone who's listening, who's an avid reader and you can relate is like, if you're really enjoying a novel and you know, you've got like 30 pages to go, you like wait until you can be sitting in your favorite chair with your coffee or your glass of wine or your hot chocolate or tea or whatever, and just be to savor that last part mm -hmm. and that, to find out how the story ends and how, if the writer has brought the threads all back tied yeah. them up at the end. Ah, there's a quilting metaphor for you. Exactly. <laughs> but I just finished reading uh, Barbara Kingsolver's new book, Demon Copperhead. And uh, I cried at the end, a good, happy tears. But also I was, I didn't want it to end because I liked being with this character demon. Although some of the parts of the book are very difficult King Solver just did such a masterly job of creating a real live human being who I was hanging out with for a week as I read the book and who I came to love. And so the idea that when I closed the book, I would 
he was out of my life. Yeah. <laughs> that really that's, got, it made that's me a great sad. compliment. Yeah. That's such a compliment to these characters can be real. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, Okay, well then let's, because I think so many of the people who are listening to this are, uh, they are fiction lovers and book lovers, and we've discussed those things. They're also quilters and quilt lovers. What's uh, what's your quilting life like these days? Oh, well, I'm I'm actually gotten back into sewing because I'm doing some th fun things where I'm taking uh, blocks, sets of blocks from the past that were never finished and kind of triaging them and making them into a quilt. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm having fun doing that. And I broke away from my latest, uh, it's, they're like, it's like a rescue dog only it's a rescue quilt. <laughs> um, there's, uh, there's that. And so, um, and I'm, and it's part of a, you know, it might be part of another project that's kind of in the, on the back burner yeah. to do that. So, um, so I'm having fun with that. And uh, just doing all the things I do here in Winterset. I'm just real busy with uh, the Iowa Quilt Museum and the Iowa Theater. We're having a, a Valentine Gala at the Iowa Theater as a fundraiser on the 4th of February dress up. And we're showing the movie It Happened One Night with Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert, which is That's awesome. That's a good movie. But, you know, and and in just talking about my life in Winterset, I'm so happy to be able to tell you we have a bookstore in Winterset now. And a, a wonderful gal, Heather, Heather Arthur's, open brick road books. And it's like, I could practically see it from my front door. It's just around the corner because we live right uptown. And so we're all wanting to support her um, to have a bookstore in a town of, you know, 6,000 people. And so the first book I bought, because I think you were going to ask me about what I was reading. Oh, the yeah. first book I bought was Hester. And Hester is, and I finished reading it and I should write a review of it, but I, I it, what the author is doing is imagining uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and a woman that he would have known when he was a young writer that might have been the inspiration for Hester Prynne. Hmm. And so, of course, I know a lot about the Scarlet Letter and all that. And and I I found the book kind of unsatisfying. I I felt like it was just kind of repetitive. And Hawthorne just you know she has a she has a crummy husband, but she's attracted to Nathaniel Hawthorne. It's like I get it, I get it, I get it. You know. So <laughs> I and I guess I was. And then I'll tell you what I'm currently reading. But I, I don't know if this happens to you, but, you know, being a writer kind of spoils reading sometimes because I, I, I'm i real picky about craft. And, you know, I hate the word it. And when they use it, I'm like, can't you find a better word? And 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 they, the ha when they start talking about she had done this and he had done this and he had done this, like, why didn't you start the story there? If they had this is so important. Why don't you start the story there? So. So Hester from a, I love the cover and I'm glad I bought it hardcover from uh, book, Brick Road Books. Um, but ultimately I can't call it a favorite, but Brick Road Books also is starting a book club. And the first book is, uh, The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna and it's historical fiction. And I'm just into it, getting into it. And I, I'm finding, I'm being picky. I find things to pick about, but it's an interesting story and I'm excited to, uh, be in a book club again, because my book club kind of went away during the pandemic. And so we're going to meet at the bookshop, which I think is just going to be just great. I can't wait. It's later this month. So I need to read my book. And then also in my life in Winterset, because of my involvement with the Iowa Theater, we launched in September the Sunday Movie Club. And so once a month uh, on Sunday afternoon, uh, earlier, not not like a matinee at seven, it's like a late, I mean, not like a 7 p.m. show, but we have a we meet at uh, 530 and we're screening recent Oscar winning films that are just enough out of the mainstream that we wouldn't screen them at the Iowa theater normally. Like we started with the power of the dog and we saw parasite and Belfast and then another round and then a hero is coming up. So these are, these are films that were critically acclaimed that won awards, but that our community would have to drive to Des Moines to see them if at all. And so we have a discussion afterwards. And so it's like a book club only with movies. So we, you know, we have a, we have a, a two people up front after the movie and we have over 50 members uh, in the Sunday movie club. So I'm really kind of in a movie club and a book club. That last. <laughs> that's, uh, I'm sorry, every time we talk about winter set, I think I'm going to move there. And then I remember where it is and what the weather is like. And I think I'm, I'm going to go visit one day. And now that it has, a, a bookstore and did you send me a picture of a cafe is right next door we, there's a coffee shop right next door I'm the I'm the landlord of it 
<laughs> when are they going to elect you mayor of Winchester? Well, well, I I I was citizen of the year for for last year. Yeah, I, I was was named this. I've got, I got the plaque to prove it. <laughs> I want a picture of the plaque. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. Bad. But the funny thing about the plaque was when they I wasn't I didn't go to the event. It's always in January, and Omicron was out there, and I didn't want to be in a room full of three hundred people, and so I did not go. And the plaque was delivered to me, and it had a typo in it. <laughs> oh, and. And for you, especially, I have to tell you, Marianne, whenever I send you an email, at some point, I just have to let it go. I'm like, she's going to, I've made a, com I'm not a common splice. I'm good with common splices, but <laughs> I, I, I've punctuated this someplace in here and she's going to notice it. I, or, I, I never, I never would. I, I think, I think everybody's emails uh, that I get are just great, but it wasn't exactly a typo. It was like a, an extra space. And so I brought it. I'm like, I can't have it like this. You know, I mean, I, I this I, I care about this plaque so much that I, I, I don't want it to have a typo in it. And so I brought it to the attention of the chamber and it turned out all the awards that was part of the boilerplate kind of. And so they mm -hmm. redid all of them. Oh, wow. Because, I mean, it's important to have it, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I, I love that, though, of course. <laughs> Of course, you you would be the one who noticed and took it and said, you will correct this. Yeah. And you will have it back was, on my bet desk by first of school tomorrow. I, I was really nice about it, though. I, I, I said, you know, it's, it's such an honor. It, it really is. No, it's, I, an, I, it's I, important. You know, I keep it on display. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, congratulations. I'm not surprised because you've done so much in that town. And, um, and there is so much to see. I really want to come to the quilt. Yeah. Museum. And now that we're now that the vaccinations and now the pandemic, we can handle it all. And I finally had COVID after two and a half years. Mark and I had COVID. We got it was pretty mild. Yeah. Got through that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I like to think that if I could, if I can, if I can make a really good book, if Winter Set can be good enough to get published and be popular, and and do what the Bridges of Madison County did for Madison County, I will be citizen of the of the forever citizen yes. of the of the you know. <laughs> yes. If they don't run me out of town because of all the, because right. of the, 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 scandal. the dark, yeah, the scandal. <laughs> all right. Tell us what I did want. I, I did want to hear what uh, you're telling us some of the books that you've read. And by the way, as a writer, I have the same issues. My book club hates me because I'm like, I just did not believe that that character would have done that. Oh, I just, you know, and they're just like, I know. let us enjoy the book. Everyone else loved it. I'm like, yeah, I, mean, I know. Third. I, I know. I'm th as I'm reading this Nightingale and thinking about the book club, I'm like, Marianne, when that club, when you go there, you've got to keep your mouth shut and not ruin this for people that aren't picky like you and not trying to write. And and I just, I'm going to, I've just got to yeah. sit on my hands and zip my lip and just, because I want to, I don't want to be kicked out of the book club. I want to be. They will. They will say no more Marianne Fonz because yeah. That's how I feel. My, my, she doesn't like anything. <laughs> no, and and I have I I have learned to do that as well. But uh, yeah, there was a period where I was like, my editor would never let me get away with that. And, <laughs> which is so obnoxious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Francis so, Leaf. Um, yes. Favorite books of all time. Well, you know, I participated in uh, Quilt Folks Patchwork and Prose, and I did um, I did Frankenstein and the Scarlet Letter. And um, Life After Life, Kate Atkinson. I love that book. Yeah. Um, and I also, Bel Canto, I haven't done, I mean, Bel Canto by Ann Patchett to me is a perfect novel. I um, agree. That's one of my favorites. And I want to reread that. Um, and I don't reread a lot now because there's so yeah. much I haven't read. But I, I, I remember just the deep pleasure of reading that book. That was, it was great. And then it never got made into the movie. It should have been made into, it would be so great. But, um, you know, I loved a book, the book, The Art of Racing in the Rain, that was told from the point of view of the dog. Uh, I thought this sounds so stupid. And then I, I just, I loved it so much. I read it a second time. Mm. Um, I'm a big fan of The Shipping News is one of the books that I read and then reread because it was so terrific. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are among my favorites. Uh, and I do love The Great Believers and uh, by Rebecca McKay. And I'm looking forward, as you are, to her next book. It's a hard act to follow. Yes. But she's I'm a sure marvelous she writer. Um, so those are those are a few that spring to my mind. Um, I love mm -hmm. reading Gone with the Wind. I've read that more. And of course, To Kill a Mockingbird is everyone's favorite, but it's perfect. Yeah. 
I love it too. I have never read the shipping news and I don't know why, how that got away from me, but so it's, it's on the list of books I missed that I want to, that I want to read. Um, There's so many, there's so many more out there to read. There's a, there's a book that, that probably no one, you or anyone has ever heard of Precious Bane by Mary Webb. Um, Find it. It's, it's a love story set in, in England. Um, Oh, such a love story. Precious Bane. Who wrote it? Mary Webb. Mary Webb. Okay. Writing mm-hmm. that down. Yeah. Well, yeah, I have never heard of it. Yeah. It's uh-huh. too, she was just obscure, obscure, obscure. I don't know how I ever came across it. And then for nonfiction, uh, No Time on My Hands by Grace Snyder. And we sell that through the Iowa Quilt Museum. It's a memoir. Um, many of the scenes of the play, the quilters were drawn from that. And, uh, I mean, it's everyone, it's like, it's, you know, growing up on the prairie, uh, in, uh, you know, in Nebraska, mm-hmm. uh, every American should, should read that. Um, Grace and Snyder made the Petty Point basket quilt, you know, with 87,000 pieces. Mm-hmm. And so her life was just, it's just a very interesting, interesting story of America. Yeah, I, I agree. And we have, uh, quilt, the f- quilt fiction has a Facebook group called the Quilt Fiction Club. And we read that together a couple of years ago. And it was just, uh, it's a deeply interesting book. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I share your love of that and your recommendation. Um, so much to read. And I know that you and I could just keep chatting. I know. I know. And, um, and, but we should probably wrap up. Um, and yeah. we'll go back to their lives. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me permission to read this story, which yeah. I absolutely enjoyed. That's um, great. And you should go back and reread it and see the I, I'm going to listen to you read it. And yeah. then I'm, I'm making a note to send you an email to get a date of when you're going to come to Winterset and visit. So, okay. so that, you know, that's what I did the happiness challenge with the New York Times last week mm-hmm. and part of it. And I did pretty well. Um, so, but you know, it's like you make a social plan, not like, oh, we should, oh, I should come to winter. So we should get together. We say, well, let's, let's, let's get together for dinner this particular time, get it on the calendar. Uh-huh. So I'm going to, I'm going to write you a note about that and see if you can actually, you know, and you can stay here. We've got a guest room at the back end with uh, its own bathroom in there. It's just real comfortable. And that would be great. That sounds wonderful. Send the email. I will and make it the invitation for summer. <laughs> Yeah, I will I'll figure out a way and Clifton and my husband will pack his cameras because I'm sure he would love yeah. to go out and about and explore. And um, but I think I it should I, be in June, you know, the airing of the quilts and the, the Iowa Quilt Festival happens in Winterset the first weekend in June. Okay. Um, and it's a wonderful time. There are quilts all over the whole community. Um, Ricky Timms is going to be here uh, teaching at the Iowa uh, Theater. Um, so. Wow. Okay. So, and other other national teachers, and it's it's a it's a great and and uh, we'll have a one artist show of Ricky Tim's work at the Iowa Cult Museum at that time. So wow. everybody, come everybody, to the airing. Everybody, let's all go. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sounds wonderful, and I have written that down. So let's make that happen. Yeah. And um, I hope that uh, we will see your books in the bookstores soon. Someday. Uh, one day, one day it's yeah. going to happen and I'm excited and I will certainly talk about them here on the Clip thank you. podcast. Marianne, thank you so much for your time and for uh, for everything. It's just been so much fun as always talking. Anytime, anytime, Francis, and best wishes to all your listeners. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're, I love the quilt fiction community. We're the best. <laughs> Quilters and readers, man. They're the best. All right. Mm-hmm. Thanks so okay, much. Okay, bye-bye. Francis here. One of the reasons I love talking to Marianne about writing is because she's so passionate about it. If you want to know more about Marianne's life story and more about her quilting story, I've put a link in the show notes to the Quilt Alliance Story Bee interview I did with Marianne in 2020. Amy Milne, the Quilt Alliance's executive director, very kindly gave me permission to share this interview with you. It's normally a Quilt Alliance members-only perk. If you're not familiar with the Quilt Alliance, it's a nonprofit organization that serves to document quilters and their stories. You can find it at quiltalliance.org. I'll put the info in the show notes. In fact, I'll put information to just about everything I've talked about today in the show notes. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Quilt Fiction. 
Tune in next month for more stories and more quilty fun. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time.